Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for coming along to the uh, Peter Sowerby Philosophy and Medicine uh, Colloquium that's uh, been organised by, by me and, more importantly, uh, by uh, Harriet Feierberg um, at King's College uh, London. Um, we are all now you're getting used to uh, this new way of doing things, which um, it's, it's all very unfortunate that we have to, we're forced to do this, but on the other hand, uh, we are keen to take advantage of the positive opportunities that it uh, affords. And um, in that case, we thought, well, look, if normally we would be have running a colloquia in, in London, inviting people who are relatively nearby, uh, but this gives us an opportunity to invite to speak to us you know, people whose work we uh, admire, but who are you know, physically located uh, further uh, afield. And so it's very exciting to sort of start this sort of new way of doing things, our new sort of colloquium format uh, you know, with uh, Katie Tab. Um, so uh, Katie uh, is uh, an assistant professor at Bard College in New York State and she previously been an assistant professor at Col Columbia. Um, she, a few years ago she completed her PhD at uh, Pittsburgh in history and philosophy of science and indeed just before that got uh, an MPhil in history and philosophy of science from uh, Cambridge. So it's great to, to, to have her. She, she, Katie's work is known to, to us and to many others um, uh, for uh, her research in, in history and philosophy of psychiatry and some interesting interactions between the history of uh, the philosophy of mind, history of uh, psychology and questions surrounding the classification uh, of uh, disease. Um, okay, so today um, Katie's going to be talking to us on the topic, what is medicine if not uh, precise? Um, I'll hand over to her in just a second, but just before we start, can I suggest that um, uh, we all um, mute our microphones, but if you wish to, it'd be nice to keep your video on so that you know, Katie can you know, see at least some of the, the audience. Um, and if you wish to, uh, please um, use the, the chat function to, you know, if you want to ask clarificatory questions as you go along, or, or Katie might want to say more, more about that, but she, she said she was willing to do something like that. But why don't I hand over to you, Katie, for what is medicine, if not uh, precise? All right, thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I've really been admiring for a while now the things that the Sorby Foundation has been making possible at KCL. Um, and as Professor Bird said, it's a pleasure to be able to kind of sneak in under these otherwise unfortunate circumstances and also to see a variety of friends and colleagues um, at a time when that feels very precious. So thank you. Um, let me see if I can share my slides. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to keep an eye on the chat if people want to ask questions of clarification as we go along. Um, oh, though now actually it disappeared now that I'm sharing my slides. So maybe, I, <laughs> maybe I'm being overly optimistic about that. Um, but yeah, people can put in questions and I can answer them um, at the end there. Okay, um, so my, my purpose today is to offer a, something like, I guess, a conceptual analysis of what precision medicine is. Um, and I'm doing so in the service of a critical argument. I want to suggest that insofar as precision medicine is a concept that's being utilized right now, it's being utilized really in an aspirational way, not as a concept that refers to very much at all in the world, though not nothing, um, but I think not much in the world right now. So um, I'm going to start off talking a bit about the precision medicine initiative, especially as it's played out in the United States. Um, I'm then going to give this analysis of the precision 
movement, we could say, um, paradigm, people like to say, uh, in terms of three projects, taxonomy, big data, and reduction. And what I want to suggest is that none of these three projects are new. Each of them have been fundamental um, projects for, for medicine in the 20th century, um, and some of them long before the 20th century, but that putting them together on a, um, an umbrella and seeing them as a package is what we're really being asked to adopt when we adopt this language of precision. I'm then gonna look at psychiatry as a case study. Um, as was mentioned, psychiatry is my um, area of focus. So I will, I will talk about it a bit. I know in my abstract, I promised to also talk about oncology. Um, I'm going to touch on that, but I just realized I had too much to say to fit that comparison in. Um, but I can refer people to a paper that will be out soon on that topic, um, if that's what lured you here. Um, and then finally, I want to I want to close by asking this question of what is medicine if it's not precise? So if one uh, does adopt my criticisms or sympathetic to my criticisms of the precision medicine movement, where are we left? And why might we want to advocate maybe for something else? That's the plan. First off, what is precision medicine? So I think many of you in the UK and in Europe as well might be more familiar with the name personalized medicine. Um, personalized medicine was used first and in the United States uh, was superseded by this language of precision in 2011. So both of these books here are um, from 2011, one by Francis Collins, who directed the um, Human Genome Project in the US, the language of life, DNA, and the revolution in personalized medicine. Um, the other is a brief that was published by our National Research Council also in 2011 called Towards Precision Medicine. Um, both of these have the imprimatur of Barack Obama. It's very small, but he blurbed the Francis Collins book here, um, and this report was prepared at his behest. Um, so I think it's around 2011 that the language starts switching in the United States from personalization to precision. I've done some uh, digging to try to figure out what motivated that shift and who brought it on. Um, and I found that there was a work group on this question, um, a federal work group, and their concern was that personalized medicine suggested that uh, the aim was to give each individual personalized care. Um, and they worried that that was uh, misleading and that actually what they intended was a sort of re-stratification of the patient population on the basis of biomarkers. Um, I think that the uh, anxiety about the suggest suggestiveness of the term personalization carries through in part because of this rhetorical lineage and in part um, because precision also I think holds that kind of promise and that's going to be key to the argument I make later on. But here's the definition. The goal of precision medicine is to quote, ensure that the right treatment is delivered to the right patient at the right time. This definition is interesting to me because it's focused on the clinic. And I think generally what we're talking about when we're talking about precision medicine is not clinical, uh, it's biomedical, and it has to do with research and development. And that's another um, line that will run through this talk. But this picture of the kind of public vision of precision medicine, I think is very important. Um, so if you look at this diagram I have in the lower right here, uh, there's this idea that um, right now, and this is a picture that certainly anyone who's ever been on a psychiatric um, um, uh, medicine will be very familiar with and in other areas of medicine as well, uh, the same pill is given out to a wide variety of patients who are presenting very differently in the clinic, but falling under an umbrella um, of a um, nosological concept. Some of those patients respond very well, some respond not at all, and some respond badly, that is, they have side effects. So the idea is if we had a way to identify the patients who would fall into each of those three groups, we could prescribe medicine, medicine accordingly and lower false positives, lower false negatives, and generally improve treatment protocols. Um, DNA is usually the kind of biomarker that is being thought about here as the way to identify these patients, though, as I'm gonna say, uh, in the case of psychiatry, importantly, not only DNA. Um, so as I said, President Barack Obama um, was a big enthusiast for precision medicine. 
Um, he unveiled the Precision Medicine Initiative in 2015 uh, with this very um, elevated language about the potential of this new approach to research to transform clinical care. You'll note up here at the top, I'm not sure if you can read this, but this historical material is frozen in time. The website is no longer updated and links to external websites and some internal pages may not work. Um, that's because I accessed this page through the Wayback Machine. It no longer exists, um, which uh, reveals a certain shift in priorities in the current administration, um, which we could certainly talk about. Um, the language of precision, I think, also comes about in the early 21st century in another context that it's worth thinking about. This is in the context of American warfare and also to some extent global warfare as well. Um, so here is our previous, previous president, uh, George W. Bush, um, a quote from him, we've applied the new powers of technology to strike an enemy force with speed and incredible precision. By a combination of creative strategies and advanced technologies, we are redefining war on our terms. In this era of warfare, we can target a regime and not a nation. Um, the idea here is that uh, there is a important contrast between something like aerial bombardment, where uh, you just come in and kind of devastate the enemy, um, as opposed to uh, targeted precision bombing of the, of the kind that started to be um, popular in World War II where you locate the enemy within the enemy nation state and you target them. Um, so this uh, language of precision, which was unveiled around the Second World War, was um, repopularized in the early 20th century to talk about things like new smart missiles um, and that sort of thing. So I think the fact that the government was using the language in these two contexts shows that there's kind of a coherence of concept here. You get in, you get out, you have a few casualties, um, or in the case of medicine, few side effects. Um, and it's inefficient, and um, the suggestion is more humane approach. So um, to get to my titular question, I think the suggestion, um, and I'm going to offer this kind of informally, and then I'm going to offer a more um, technical account of what's happening here. The suggestion, both in the warfare case and in the medicine case, if things aren't precise, what are they? Well, they're kind of inefficient. Um, they may be ineffective, at least for some, in a way that's unpredictable. Um, there's also, I think, this suggestion that they're dangerous, right? That there's, um, that there's risk to those of us who aren't being analyzed and, um, and scrutinized to see if it's the appropriate medicine for us. Um, and around these three worries, I think, you know, we can see others. It's, uh, if it's not precise, it's kind of old fashioned. Um, it's like the old, you know, bedside manner, physician expertise. Um, and I think there's a lot to say, and philosophers of medicine have said a lot about the relationship between precision medicine and other movements towards the um, precisification of medicine. So things like evidence-based medicine um, and other uh, approaches to making medicine more rigorous and more data-driven. Um, yeah, so the suggestion that maybe not unprecise medicine or medicine before the revolution is, is unscientific in a way that we should be worried about. Um, and then a worry that it's vague, that it just is um, ill-defined, um, and that vague also in the sense of reference. So what patients fall under which diagnostic categories is just kind of sloppy. Um, ultimately, that the practitioner who is doing imprecise medicine is careless. That that's a practitioner who isn't availing themselves of the best technologies, be that a diagnostic test to look for a biomarker or um, new taxonomic practices that are emerging out of the precision medicine movement. So I'll return to that, um, but I want to turn now to uh, the analysis that I want to give of what precision medicine is uh, in terms of these three different projects. Um, and as I said, the projects are taxonomy, big data, and reduction. Um, and um, yeah, so, so right, so none of these are new. Um, all of them, I think, have been reimagined. But what I want to emphasize is I think what's crucial about precision medicine and what's new is the suggestion that they're concomitant, that they have to come together, that they mutually reinforce each other, and that this package of precision um, needs to prioritize them in, in particular ways that I will talk about. Um, and the, the overall story I want to tell is that I think uh, imprecise medicine there was, a, there, was a, there was an understanding that it went something like this. You start with the taxonomy, 
um, and again, I'll focus on psychiatry, where there we have a very uh, particular taxonomy that at this point is, is hegemonic, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, as I'll, as I'll discuss. Um, you then want to improve your understanding of the categories that make up your taxonomy. You do that through the collection of data towards the end of the 20th century, increasingly so-called big data. Um, and the aim there is to get a better reductive picture, to understand the mechanisms and the causes that underlie the phenomena that you're interested in. Now, under precision medicine, the order of operations has been switched. So the idea is you start with big data, and this is often described as a bottoms up approach, um, which I think has all kinds of positive implications that people are very attached to. So um, you start with big data, you then kind of see what falls out of the data. Um, and that might be a genotype of interest, it might be a, a variety of um, gene variants that you discover through a, a genome wide association study. Um, or it might be a, a gene product, or, sorry, a protein product that leads you to a better understanding of a causal pathway. Um, it might be a neural signature. Then you re adjudicate your taxonomy on the basis of this transformation in your understanding of the phenomena uh, through reduction. So, looking at each of these in turn, um, this gets back to that original kind of goofy graphic I showed you. The presumption of precision is that if you get a larger and larger sample, you can hone in on these different strata of response in your population. Um, so you can group together those who don't benefit from a treatment, you can group together those who benefit from a treatment, and then you can look and see what those people have in common. And ideally what you're looking for is some kind of biomarker that will allow you to track um, which people fall into which group. And this is a way to minimize false positives um, and false negatives. In the United States, this is manifested in uh, a million person cohort effort uh, called the All of Us um, Project. And this cohort program was introduced, um, kind of it was slowly um, unveiled after Obama's announcement in 2015. And the aim you can see is to gather data on a million Americans. Um, their DNA data for sure. Uh, also things like diet, lifestyle, health outcomes, um, really to get as comprehensive a picture of these million people as possible. Um, I can say uh, my previous employer at Columbia was one of the recruitment centers for this effort. And we were charged especially with recruiting members of the African-American community, given our location um, and given the importance of that constituency for this effort. Um, and uh, when, last time I checked, we were behind by, I think, like a factor of 10. I mean, it's just incredibly, incredibly hard to get people to give up this amount of data. Um, and there are lots of interesting questions about why, especially in the African-American community um, for historically, um, I think, fairly obvious reasons for those of us who work in the history of medicine. Um, but that's the idea, is to get this million person cohort so that we have the data that we need on all these factors. Um, another thing I wanna note about this, and I'll say more about it later, is that most of the success at recruitment has come in getting the DNA data. It's much easier to get a blood sample and then genotype someone and to get their permission for that than it is to get them to write down what they eat every day or when they exercise or to give over more sensitive um, health information because you know we all would prefer to lie about that. Um, okay, so what do you do with this data? This is an article by um, my old colleague, uh, oh, well, about my old colleague uh, at Columbia, David Goldstein. Um, and David has been using these huge data sets to find tiny, tiny genetic mutations that can explain very, very, very rare conditions. So we're talking about conditions that affect really only, you know, a few hundred people. Um, and this article profiled uh, this young boy named Bertrand, who he um, really, I mean, saved his life by using this kind of analysis. And so this kind of story, I think, has been very, very exciting for people. Um, when you when these these rare you know so-called traditionally called orphan diseases are sort of adopted by this new um, group of scientists that is population geneticists working with um, with molecular geneticists. Okay, turning to reduction, um, what do we mean by reduction in philosophy of science? We generally mean the expl explanation of higher level phenomena at lower levels of analysis. 
um, there's been an interest in thinking about human beings at every possible level of reduction to get what's been called a perfect omics portrait. And by omics, we just mean all the ohms, right? So the genome and the epigenome um, to the microbiome. And the idea here is that this picture of medicine in the future would draw on all these different levels to look for the kind of biomarkers that allow us to predict better treatment response. So there's kind of this endless push downwards in terms of explanation. Um, finally, taxonomy. By taxonomy, I just mean the classification of diseases, um, which has gone through some interesting transformations under the aegis of precision medicine. So the big sort of success case for precision medicine has been in oncology, also immunology. Um, I think immunology increasingly is where precision medicine has kind of come into its own. Um, but the first field to kind of take off under this umbrella of precision was, was oncology. Um, and the, the kind of poster child of this effort has been Herceptin. Um, and Herceptin is a chemotherapy drug. Um, it's the, the brand name for trastuzumabab. Um, and this chemotherapy works very well with people whose tumors are overexpressing um, a particular gene, the HER2 new gene. Um, it doesn't work at all for people whose tumors are not expressing that gene. Um, the reason this is interesting from a taxonomic perspective is because it's really shifted the way that different kinds of cancers have been thought about um, because some cancers uh, carry this uh, or they overexpress um, uh, HER2 uh, that are located in all different parts of the body. So it's not only breast cancers, it's not only prostate cancers, um, it's some breast cancers, right? Um, so it ends up being much more beneficial for the oncologist to reclassify patients in terms of whose tumor has this particular biomarker, um, because then we know whose tumor will respond to this medication, to Herceptin. Um, so you get this really dramatic shift away in oncology from locating tumors in the body, which has been going on for you know, centuries, maybe millennia, um, to uh, locating them in terms of their genomes. Okay, um, so as I said, I'm interested in this kind of shift. I'm interested in the turn to uh, the championing of big data as a place to start um, and reduction as a, um, as a appropriate next step for improving taxonomy. Um, I want to look at psychiatry to show not only how this has happened in psychiatry, but where I think it's really gone wrong. Um, and, you know, I'm picking psychiatry, as I said, it's, it's my area, um, also because I think psychiatry often is an interesting sort of canary in the coal mine. Um, it's a very badly behaved science. Um, it, it's a very insecure science. It's, um, you know, fraught with um, all sorts of Cartesian worries all the time. Um, and because of this, I think when psychiatry shows problems, it often shows them in a more magnified way. And when we go look, we find them in other areas of medicine. Um, and so for those of you who work in other areas, I'll be really interested to hear about to what extent you think this analysis applies elsewhere. And as I said, I've been thinking about the oncology case as, as, a, as a sort of foil. Um, but so just a little background for those of you who don't work in psychiatry. Um, as I said, psychiatry has a sort of Bible of taxonomy, uh, the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, the manual has gone through a lot of changes. Um, it started out as really a statistical tool um, to be used to help with the census uh, for uh, soldiers returning from the war, um, from World War I. Um, the manual uh, famously went through a shift from being very sort of Freudian and very uh, interested in, 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 in causes to being much more operational so that um, anyone should be able to use it and have the same outcomes. Um, I see, our, see Anke is here and she could explain to us all how miserably that failed, um, but I won't go into that right now, except to say that one of the results of the DSM taking on all these different roles is that it ended up serving just a lot of different purposes. Um, so once it moved away from the Freudian paradigm, it became of interest for biomedical researchers working in a variety of fields. Um, it also became the key manual for researchers developing new pharmaceutical treatments such that, um, and this is a, a figure that's a bit old now and it'd be interesting to, to have it again, um, but it's a figure that I got from Bruce Cuthbert who just did a little study that he never published on um, how 
researchers were talking about their research in the main psychiatric journals. So in um, JAMA Psychiatry, in the American Journal of Psychiatry and Biological Psychiatry. Um, and he saw that in 90% of those articles, researchers were presenting their research as being about a single DSM disorder, and the rest were about more than one disorder. But it has become very, very rare and also very difficult uh, to do psychiatric research that isn't targeting one of the diagnoses of the DSM. And this is, of course, not only America. The DSM has been one of America's many um, successful, perhaps regrettable, exports to the rest of the world. Um, so those of you who've trained up in other systems will also be familiar with it. Um, so this question of what these categories really are, who do they serve, what do they refer to, has just caused endless ink to be spilled in my field of philosophy of psychiatry. Um, I've gotten suspicious of this project of figuring out what kind of thing psychiatric disorders are, in part because the scientists themselves have, have really started to lose interest in this question. Um, there's just been disappointment after disappointment in the search for any kind of single underlying essence for the major categories that we think about, by which I mean things like general anxiety disorder or um, schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Um, I'll just read this quote from Ken Kendler, who's a, a um, prominent psychiatric geneticist. Psychiatric genetics has taught us a great deal about the nature of psychiatric disorders, but provided painful lessons. We know that familial and genetic factors make an important contribution, oops, make an important contribution to the etiology of all necessary psychiatric disorders. Yet despite our wishing so, individual gene variants of large effects appear to have small to non-existent role in the etiology of major psychiatric disorders. And he goes on kind of in this pessimistic vein that genetics just simply hasn't helped us to understand not only what the essence of uh, mental disorders are, but also what um, the mechanisms that those genes lead to are and what the causal pathway is that would get us up to a thorough understanding of these conditions. Um, here's a quote from Ben Leahy, who's a psychologist. Categorical mental disorders do not, quote unquote, line up one to one with variations in the functioning of neural circuits. Rather, neural circuits align with narrower neurobehavioral constructs that are themselves related to psychopathology in a cross-cutting fashion. Dysfunctions in each construct is related to multiple forms of psychopathology, and most forms of psychopathology are related to dysfunction in more than one construct. So his point here is that many of the psychiatric disorders that we care about, when you look at them on the level of neuroscience, those categories are cross-cut by the entities of interest for the psychiatric neuroscientist. Um, this has led to worries that these categories are actually standing in the way of doing good science that if you're looking for the neural circuits of interest in explaining psychiatric disorders, you might not want to look at the level of any particular disorder. You might want to think about psychopathology more generally. Um, because the categories have shaped the way that people talk about their research and present their research, this has also become a um, literal obstacle for obtaining funding. So this is a quotation from Steve Hyman, who also got his MPhil in history and philosophy of science at the University of Cambridge. Um, and, uh, and so always takes this kind of philosophical approach to everything, which makes him uh, very useful for me. Um, he got worried about this, what he called the reification of, uh, of psychiatric disorders. Um, and he talked about during his time as director of the National Institute of Mental Health, he found that certain kinds of research just couldn't be funded because it didn't refer to things that were kind of approved of by the DSM. So he says, given the status of the DSM-4 criteria as the community consensus, the US Food and Drug Administration held that it could not by itself recognize cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia as an indication for the development and approval of new treatments. That's because those cognitive, uh, negative cognitive symptoms were just not included in the DSM diagnostic criteria. They were in an appendix, and therefore uh, they didn't meet the FDA's criteria. Um, so Hyman has called this an epistemic prison, uh, the DSM an epistemic prison, palpably impeding scientific progress for this reason. Um, when he stepped down from directing our National Institute of Mental Health and Thomas Insel took over, the DSM was really kicked out. So there was a very kind of dramatic and public dispute between the American Psychiatric Association and the National Institute of Mental Health as the NIMH moved away from the use of the DSM. This came in step, and this is important to my story, with an embrace of neuroscience um, by, uh, by the NIMH. Um, so uh, Thomas Insel, who took over as director, was himself a neuroscientist. And there's this sort of shift 
uh, that we see in priorities of the NIMH. And crucially, this shift is put in terms of precision medicine. Right? So this is a commentary that Infil gave in 2014. Uh, the NIMH Research Domain Criteria Project, I'll tell you what that is in a minute, is precision medicine for psychiatry. Okay, so what does this precision medicine project look like? Uh, the research domain criteria matrix is this enormous matrix. I'm just showing you a little piece of it. Um, and it's divided up into levels of analysis. So here's the reduction, going from genes all the way up to the level of self-report. Um, and then it collects together constructs, mostly borrowed from neuroscience and cognitive science. Um, that is areas of interest for people thinking about mental illness. Um, so here's just an example of a few, but again, this chart goes on for a very long time. So things like working memory or attention. And the idea is that when researchers approach the NIMH for funding support, they no longer describe their research in terms of the categories of the DSM. They instead describe it as a cell on this matrix. Right. So you might be someone who works on working memory and you might work at the level of molecules. And so you would pitch yourself here. You don't have to talk about traditional categories of mental illness at all. The chart also acts as a kind of live database so you can click on any cell um, to see the so-called elements, which are um, peer reviewed conclusions about interesting things happening at that area. And you can kind of click and click and click. Um, so it's become a bit of a, of a repository. So when we look at the aims of this new precision medicine for psychiatry, I think we see the three factors that I've identified as key to precision medicine. Um, this is from a, a sort of manifesto for precision medicine um, written in 2012. First, mental disorders are presumed to be disorders of brain circuits. Right? There's your reductionism. Um, and uh, secondly, it's assumed that the tools of clinical neuroscience, including functional neuroimaging, electrophysiology and new methods for measuring neural connections can be used to identify dysfunction in neural circuits. Those are big data. And finally, the RDOC approach presumes that data from genetics research and clinical neuroscience will yield biosignatures that will augment clinical signs and symptoms for the purposes of clinical intervention and management. Um, okay, I want to briefly, and this isn't really my aim in this talk, but um, I want to briefly touch on why I think this is a total misnomer for contemporary psychiatry and even for the kind of efforts that the NIMH was making under INCEL. Um, uh, you know, I think psychiatry, as I said, has had problems for a while. In particular, it hasn't done well at explaining its categories. Um, so this traditional picture, medical picture, where you improve on your understanding of your taxonomy, maybe you revise your taxonomy through reductive approaches to understanding the phenomenon of interest. That just hasn't gone anywhere. Um, so psychiatry, really, we don't have any mechanistic understanding for any major category. There's little bits, um, but we don't have causal pathways uh, like in other fields of medicine. Um, so the attempt to kind of rejigger the order of operations, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think there are issues um, in all three areas for precision psychiatry and also in the um, perceived pathway to improvement. So I'm gonna to touch on them. And the reason I wanna to touch on them today is just to generally raise some foundation for suspicion about precision medicine as an actual descriptor for many branches of medicine. I think there are analogous reasons to worry about other branches of medicine, not necessarily as comprehensively, um, but I think that they are there. Um, okay, so first of all, big data. Um, you know, something might have already caught your attention, which is uh, when we talk about precision psychiatry, we're talking about neuroscience, we're not talking about genetics. Um, the reason for that is that genetics has basically been, um, you know, it's, 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 it's very much live of, as a field of inquiry, but it's clear that it's gonna take a very, very long time for it to become relevant for the kind of translational research that leads to insights in um, the clinic because there's just so much work to get through all those levels of analysis. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So the NIMH for that reason, after the decade of the gene, um, moved on to the decade of the brain and has become very interested in neural circuitry. Um, getting data on a million people's brains is prohibitively expensive. It can't be done, right? I mean, fMRI studies are just hugely expensive, um, unlike uh, genome sequencing, which has gotten quite 
cheap. So there's already just a bit, bit of a disjoint in terms of what it would look like to do precision psychiatry. There's also this question of why start with the neural circuits. Um, as I said, there's been a kind of loss of enthusiasm about genetics. Um, but if you talk to psychiatric geneticists, they are um, also think that they're on the trail of exciting discoveries. They're just taking longer for the reasons I just laid out. So why skip ahead to the neural circuitry? It's possible there's no good reason except for the fact that the guy who got his hands on the reins of power at the NIMH is a, is a neuroscientist. Um, he's interestingly, I mean, he's a fascinating character and he, uh, Incel, has recently um, publicly expressed a kind of um, concern and even remorse for the shift towards a neuro-focused neuro um, kind of psychiatry, um, which I could talk more about later. Um, you know, collecting big data in psychiatry uh, is a challenge for a lot of reasons, but this, this chart is like intended to be overwhelming um, and you don't need to pay much attention to it, except that um, these are all different layers of causes that go into an episode of major depressive disorder. Uh, this is a chart put together by Ken Kendler and his colleagues, um, and they did amazing work really uh, trying to quantify the causal relationships between all these different levels. Genetic risk is just up here in this little corner, right? Um, the different colors represent different life stages, um, and uh, uh, and um, you know every one of these levels is fascinating. Uh, is part of the explanation. We would need data on all of them. So the challenge is very different from collecting big data in a field like oncology, I think. Okay, what about reduction? Um, as I said, there's lots of reasons to worry about finding ge genetic biomarkers that will be clinically useful at least any time soon. Um, when we found neurophysiological biomarkers, and there's been some success there, they tend to just be correlative. Um, so, you know, yeah, so part of the brain lights up for people who have certain signs and symptoms of psychosis, for example, um, they don't give us much information about the mechanisms. So again, the translational work of turning those sorts of results into new treatment protocols um, is, is far off. This is very different from what we mean when we talk about precision in a field like oncology, where we're finding biomarkers that are informative both about the causal pathway leading to the disease, but also about mechanisms for treatment response. And our biomarkers in, in psychiatry are doing neither of those things. Um, so I'll just gesture here towards the work that I've been doing comparing oncology and psychiatry, and this is joint work with my Lemoine at Bordeaux. Um, and we've been thinking about it in terms of these little like staircases to success. Um, so in oncology, you start with the discovery of what we're calling direct biomarkers. That is those biomarkers that really inform you about what's going on causally in the disease. That leads you to develop specific treatments and ultimately you transform your classification in the way I've been describing. Um, psychiatry is behind, right? So this staircase just starts a lot lower. We're trying to identify what Mayel and I, um, following Bechtel and Richardson, have been calling loci of control, or where you can kind of reach in and intervene um, on a disease. We're first just trying to figure out where you should do that. Is it at the level of the neural circuit? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Maybe it's in the gut, right? I mean, right now, psychiatry is just, there's so much. It's a really exciting time to be thinking about psychiatry, partially because we literally don't even know where to look. Um, for the most rewarding causal explanations. Um, so we'd have to get there, and then maybe we'd get to the stage of finding those direct biomarkers that oncology is starting with right now. So the picture is just very different. Um, Incel wrote this in 2014. Uh, the RDoc project begins with the humble realization that we do not know enough to develop a precision medicine approach to mental disorders. We need a decade of intense scientific work from molecular factors to social determinants to understand normal and abnormal behavior based on a deep understanding of the mechanisms. Um, so this is later in cell and he's getting a little cautious um, because for reasons I'll turn to in a minute, he didn't see the successes he was expecting in terms of reduction. Um, finally, taxonomy. So one reason oncology has been transforming its taxonomic practices is because it has grounds to do so that have obvious clinical application. Right. If you look at the level of the gene, there's an immediate benefit for figuring out which treatment protocols are appropriate for a patient. In psychiatry, this just isn't, hasn't happened. And we have a lot of different levels of analysis that, again, are cross-cutting each other in terms of what they see as significant. Um, so if you divide patients up on the basis of um, genetic risk factors or on the basis of neurological signatures or on the basis of clinical signs and symptoms, you get different populations. 
right? You don't get this neat kind of sorting once you go through all these different sieves of different levels of analysis. This is a problem. Um, again, it's very complicated. Um, our doc stands in an interesting relation to classification because our doc came out, as I said, very publicly as a kind of rebuke to the DSM, as a challenge to the DSM. Um, but it also became quickly clear that the RDOC has no protocol for classifying patients at all. What RDOC does is it classifies research projects so that they can be funded. Totally different aim. Um, so in 2013, Burton Kozak wrote, although RDOC is labeled as an experimental classification approach, it actually is not a classification system in a formal sense. It might be better termed an experiment towards classification. Um, Similarly, in cell and Cuthbert rate, the idea is, oops, sorry, doing that. The idea is to start by specifying basic dimensions of functioning. They're imp implementing brain circuits that have been identified by the last several decades of research and brain behavior. Then in this light, mental disorders are considered as extremes at one or both tails of these normal distributions. I've talked to a bunch of folks at the NIMH and um, advocates and apologists for RDOC about how they would define psychopathology under RDOC. And this is the answer I get often, that you have a bell curve um, and people at each end of it are outliers and those are the people that you would treat clinically. Um, this is a just uh, really troubled approach to thinking about the normal and the pathological. Um, you know, it's, it's what we teach in philosophy medicine 101, right? You have all kinds of cases, um, you know, pregnant women are outliers whose mortality is increased, right? Do we want to say they have a disease? Not quite. Um, most of us have tooth plaque, but we still want to say that we have a disease. Um, so, you know, this, this picture is just troubling. Also, where, of course, are the cutoffs, right? Um, there's a lot to say about this, but it doesn't work. Uh, this has been noticed by others. So Jerry Wakefield, um, who's a social worker and philosopher of psychiatry has written, the DSM and ICD provides the only thoughtful guidance to what conditions the RDOC must explain in terms of malfunctioning circuits. So in other words, once you give up the traditional taxonomy, you're just in trouble. There's no way to demarcate the normal from the pathological anymore. Um, and we haven't found a way to replace it, even as we've turned away for reasons that, um, you know, many think are very justified from using these traditional diagnostic manuals. Okay. Um, I just want to briefly touch on um, a criticism that uh, I've received for, for pushing this kind of line, this, this skeptical line about precision psychiatry. Um, and I won't talk about it at length. I have a paper on it if people are interested. Um, but the criticism is just, well, okay, so psychiatry isn't precise yet. Right? And you can generalize this for all of medicine. You can just say, okay, like there's some reasons to worry about precision. Um, but precision maybe just is an aspirational value, and maybe that's okay. I want to suggest that there are reasons to worry about that line of defense for precision medicine. Um, this is a diagram um, that Incel put together, um, and he put it together in 2005. 2005 is down here, the x-axis is time, 2025 is here. Um, and the y-axis is a bit confusing, but it seems to be increasingly um, effective technological interventions. What interests me is this slope that he sees increasing steadily from 2005 to 2025, starting with pathophysiology, where we diagnose patients through um, a system of trial and error on the basis of their symptoms. This is a picture in psychiatry as well as other fields of medicine. Um, and Insel thought that by 2015, we would have shifted to using biodiagnostics, that is those biomarkers I've been discussing, to treat the core pathology. This would allow for the decade between 2015 and 2025 um, to be the so-called decade of translation, where all of this work from biomedicine would allow for the introduction of personalized care, that is precision medicine, to really take off. Um, now, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but my mouse is about between 2015, 2025 here, where we are, right? Um, we're a bit off schedule, right? We're a little behind. Um, this, I think, raises profound ethical questions, which I'm not going to talk about here, but I've been calling a problem of diachronic justice um, that we need to know when precision medicine pays off if we're putting all our money into it now. This is a simple, um, traditional problem for bioethicists. But I'll leave that for now, except to say that I think 
this optimism is not just in psychiatry, it's everywhere. This is a very similar graphic that I found from an advocate of precision medicine more generally. Okay, um, so that's precision medicine. That's how it works in psychiatry. I think you have a sense of the criticisms um, that I have for it. Um, but to bring them further into view, I want to do a kind of um, negative space conceptual analysis and go back to this question of what precision medicine is not. Um, the rhetoric of precision, as I said, is this optimistic picture of precision kind of taking each of us up in its arms, giving us what we need, carrying us to safety. Right. Herceptin has been the poster child for this. We also love stories about small children and precision medicine. Uh, I want to show you this. This is a direct to consumer. This is like, I mean, this talk is in some ways a talk about rhetoric of science, and, and we're getting there now. Um, and this is a direct to consumer uh, advert, as I believe you would say. Um, we are all zebras. How rare disease is shaping the future of healthcare? Um, anyway. Anyone who's been to medical school, maybe like of a certain vintage, um, or who has watched the show House, might also be familiar with this uh, this truism. If you hear hoofbeats behind you, assume it's a horse, right? Um, this is a, 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 a Western and um, fairly offensive, I think, actually, thing to tell medical students because you're assuming that they're in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, my parents-in-law trained in Southern Africa, where if you hear hoofbeats, you know, it could be a number of things. Um, but the idea is you shouldn't look for the weird thing, right? You shouldn't assume that a patient coming in has a rare genetic anomaly when maybe they just have asthma, right? You shouldn't assume in the ER that someone has the unusual thing you just read about in your medical textbook when probably they're just having a heart attack. Um, precision medicine wants us to do the opposite. It wants us to believe that we are all zebras, that our healthcare must take this very particularized, critical, careful approach to thinking about us in all our complexity, right? So this ad says, um, when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras. Dr. Woodward told his medical interns in the 1940s to teach them the art of diagnosis. That was then, this is now. Now there's precision medicine, a revolution in healthcare based on the rare disease model. Precision medicine sees the zebra in all of us and focuses on not what makes you part of the herd, but what makes you unique. Um, in fact, you are a rainbow zebra, which seems kind of superfluous. But. Um, so yeah, this is the way it's been marketed. Um, I want to suggest that what this language is trying to make us believe is that the opposite of medicine is not only all these, these, these kind of bad things um, that, that are, have been sort of implied, um, but I think it's actually targeting something quite specific, which is what we may call general medicine. Um, by general medicine, I mean a couple of things. Um, one is public health and epidemiology. Um, so you might be familiar with this triangle of public health. Um, I'm going to read you just a couple of quotes from an article by uh, Tom Friedman on the future of public health that was published in the New England Journal um, a little bit ago. Uh, blood pressure control, which can save more lives than any other clinical intervention, is successful in only about half of Americans. Nearly 90% of patients with uncontrolled hypertension have been um, have both health insurance and a regular source of care, and more than 80 have multiple contacts with the health system each year. Right. Um, so something like blood pressure is easy to control. It's something that you learn about, both um, you learn about the um, biomedicine of it, but you also learn about the epidemiology of it through looking at large samples, right? Um, and it's the horse disease. It's the thing that many of us have in our lifetimes. Um, Freeman says, to maximize health overall, both communicable and non-communicable diseases, disease threats need to be addressed in the United States and globally. There are important connections between infectious and non-infectious diseases. Most cases of cervical cancer and many cases of liver cancer can now be prevented through vaccination. Diabetes, obesity, tobacco, and alcohol use increases risks of both cancer and infection. So this is a very familiar drum that public health experts beat, right? If you want to stop cancer, sure, we need research into the genetics of cancer, but we also just need public health awareness campaigns about things like smoking um, that have been so transformative for rates of these diseases. The other thing I think we might need mean by general medicine um, is family medicine, is what your general practitioner does when you go to see them. Um, I borrowed both this graphic and the quote I will read you from um, the 
website of the Department of General Internal Medicine at the University of British Columbia, which I think does a wonderful job of recruitment by really describing what is so heroic about going into family medicine as opposed to other areas. Um, so they say general internal medicine is a subspecialty of internal medicine, which embraces the values of generalism, is aligned with population needs and promotes the practitioner's ability to adapt to their practice profile when populations need change. General internists provide comprehensive care of the adult patient in an integrative fashion, as opposed to an organ-centered or disease-centered approach. General internists advocate for their individual patients, as well as for all patients within complex healthcare delivery systems by aiming to optimize, not maximize care, including prevention and other conditions. General internists recognize that the practice of medicine is tightly linked to the art and science of healthcare delivery, and by virtue of their pivotal role, are uniquely placed to engage in quality improvement, patient safety, and healthcare systems initiatives. So, you know, I think when you have a good GP, what that person is doing is they're mediating for you. They're your advocate, um, and they're mediating for you with the larger healthcare system that's being provided by your government, um, or that increasingly you are having to pay for and buy from uh, private industry. So they should be translating for you, not only the research that's coming out of the biomedical industry itself, um, but also helping you to navigate your own choices and thinking more broadly about things like lifestyle, right? Or things like environmental risks and not just uh, lower levels of explanation. So you might think, well, why can't we be ecumenical? I've been setting up this talk as if there's an adversarial relationship between precision medicine and general medicine. Um, why not just have both? This is uh, a view that has been increasingly plaintively presented by Francis Collins, who says there's a false dichotomy uh, that you have to have either precision medicine or population health, but there's not a, not a conflict. Um, there is a conflict, certainly in psychiatry where I work, there's conflict. Um, Here's a, a number on that. Um, since Incel strategic plan was implemented, NIMH is spending on basic science, and that includes translational science as well, has gone up by 28%, while the budget for research into epidemi epidemiology treatment and health services has gone down by 16.7, bringing the overall budget to around a 50-50 split between basic science research and clinical translation research. And I should note in the US, we have a government body to fund general science research, basic science research. It's the National Science Foundation. So the National Institute of Mental Health is there to fund research into psychiatry. Um, part of what drove my interest in this project was talking to researchers who just can't get funded because they're working at these higher levels of analysis, increasingly from the NIMH, um, and there aren't really other sources of funding in our country. Um, and I won't read through these facts, but these are similar to the ones pointed out in the Frieden article for mental health. Um, that right now there's a crisis in providing care, and that's care that we know already, right? Um, we need research into how to apply the protocols that we know work, as well as research into the discovery of new protocols. Um, I wanna end with a quote from my old colleague at Columbia, Ron Beyer, um, and Ron uh, works in the, um, in the public health school at Columbia. Research undertaken in the name of precision medicine may well open new vistas of science, and precision medicine itself may ultimately make critical contributions to a narrow set of conditions that are primarily genetically determined. But the challenge we face to improve population health does not involve the frontiers of science and molecular biology. It entails development of the vision and willingness to address certain persistent social realities, and it requires an unstinting focus on factors that matter most to the production of population health. This is, I think, more pressing now than ever. We have more evidence of this right now than I certainly ever have in my lifetime. Um, I will out myself as a convalescent COVID recoverer. I had a very unpleasant case that went on for about six weeks. Um, and I will say that I saw something really sad happen during that time. I was very early. I was the third person in my county to get it. Um, and so for about the first 10 days, I had a nurse who came every day, parked outside my window. I would go to the window and wave so she knew I wasn't absconding under my quarantine. And then we would talk about my symptoms. She would ask if I needed anything. She would provide things when she could. Um, and it was very comforting. It went on for 10 days and then she just never showed up again. And I called her number and I couldn't get her on the phone. And I actually have an order telling me that I'm under quarantine that I never got rescinded by the governor. So I guess I'm just a criminal now, I don't know. Um, but what I saw in real time was the breakdown of the American capacity to contact trace, 
to quarantine and to have any kind of public health response to this epidemic. And now um, I don't have to tell you in England uh, the, the state of this crisis. Um, this is a wonderful editorial on this question that came out the day I was putting finishing touches on my editorial on the same topic, which I am now trying to rejigger so it's not too redundant with this one. Um, but I think this is, you know, this question of whether we should be funding personalized precision medicine to the extent we are is now more pressing than ever. Um, and I think for those of us who care about general medicine uh, in the broad sense that I have defined it, um, now is the time to really make some noise about this, especially when it concerns our tax dollars, as it does uh, both in the UK and in the US. So I will stop there. Thank you so much.